Hey everybody, I'm Dan McClellan. I'm a scholar of the Bible and religion, and the fit is still Metallica and Justice because this is part two of my response to criticisms of my video on the King James Version. On the one hand, because if it's true that these people are intentionally trying to produce a Bible in which accessibility is not a priority, then obviously they simply would not publish it. So this is an absolutely laughable straw man to say a translation prioritizes literalness over accessibility is not to say that a translation is actively trying to suppress the accessibility of the translation. The idea that the King James Bible was poorly received at first is also cartoonish. It's just false. So as I've shown, the leading scholars of the history and the influence of the King James Version widely agree that it was not well received in the 17th century and it would not become influential until the Great Awakenings of the 18th and the 19th century turned people's interest back to more antiquarian literature and they went back to the King James Version because thanks to the Church of England, that was the only Bible that was there. It's one of the best and most well received Bibles in all of human history. It surpassed the Vulgate. It surpasses basically every other form of publication that has ever been produced. Yes, but not initially. That didn't happen until the 19th century. But beyond that, let's talk about why they actually chose the Elizabethan as a specific dialect of English as opposed to various other options. They did in fact have available to them at the time. This is all false. The King James translators were given no option whatsoever. They were told precisely what language they were going to be using. King James drafted a list of 15 rules, what we might call a translation brief today. And rule number one was that they were going to be doing a very conservative revision of the Bishop's Bible. So the language they were going to be using was the language of the Bishop's Bible, which was itself language going back to Tyndall and Coverdale. And rule number one said that they were to alter it as little as the truth of the original will permit. So no, they had no choice regarding what kind of language they were going to be using. Before we do so though, we have to talk about the various modes of language and how they impact our understanding and interactions with the very thing on a daily basis. So now this creator is going to talk for several minutes about how the King James Version was designed for oral consumption. In other words, to be heard as it was read to a congregation. And this is absolutely true. Uh, the very front of the King James Bible says, appointed to be read in churches. It was designed for an ecclesiastical leader of some kind to read to a congregation, which was why it was loaded with tons of punctuation so that there were natural pausing spots so that people could hear shorter chunks at a time and it would be easier for them to understand within the congregation, or at least that was the intent. The point here is, is that Elizabethan English was electively chosen by the translation committee, the people, the brains behind the authorized version, because it is so phonetically pleasing to hear. So this video is actually not even engaging in questions of literalness or accessibility. It is just praising the King James Version for its aesthetic qualities. And you'll recall that I highlighted Stephen Prickett's article about how in the 19th century, when the pendulum swung in the direction of praise for the King James Version, it was all exclusively aesthetic. And why? Because the King James Version had become successfully embedded in the linguistic foundation of English and particularly American English. So this creator is just confusing the praise that developed in the 19th century for how the King James Version was viewed in the 17th century. And it's not a mistake as well that there is an enormous heap of language, turn of phrase, that was originally found exclusively in the King James Bible that is now simply passed from it into general use vernacular because it's sticky like that. For example, the golden rule, whatsoever ye would that man should do unto you, do even so unto them. 
It's very easy to recite it. It's very easy for you to memorize it. Yes, it's so sticky that you couldn't even quote it correctly. That's not the King James Version. This is the King James Version. Whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. But the King James translators did not translate it this way. This is word for word from the Bishop's Bible. Whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. And this is only a slight revision from the Geneva Bible. Whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, even so do ye to them. And guess what? This is word for word Tyndall's translation from 1526, 34 years earlier. Whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, even so do ye to them. So the King James translators did not create anything new here. They didn't introduce any change whatsoever. They just reproduced exactly what came before. So at least regarding this creator's single example, this statement here. There is an enormous heap of language, turn of phrase, that was originally found exclusively in the King James Bible that is now simply passed from it into general use vernacular because it's sticky like that. For example, the golden rule, whatsoever ye would that man should do unto you, do even so unto them, is 100% false. And so let me transition here of that if you like the King James Bible or you want to engage with it and you want to get the absolute most out of it that you can possibly get, you need to have someone reading it out loud. And if you do that, I'm willing to guarantee that you will actually find that the King James Bible, the 1611 authorized version, is more accessible to you than most other published edition. That's absolutely the way it was meant to be experienced, but the notion that it is maximally accessible is simply false. I've already shared the academic consensus regarding literalness and accessibility, but I want to share an example of this just so you can see how inaccessible it is because of literalness. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 from the 1611 authorized version. I'm going to read it out loud to you, and I guarantee you 100% that you will not understand what it means. You cannot understand what it means. And the reason is because it is an overly literal reproduction of the word order of the Greek and because the syntax is unclear in English because we don't have cases, you cannot understand what this means. Here we go. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Now, what on earth does this mean? It is absolutely impenetrable English because it is trying to reproduce the syntax of the Greek without concern for how accessible it is. The reality is that what this is saying is if anybody has caused grief, they've not grieved me, but to some degree all of you, but I don't want to exaggerate. And ignore Dan McClellan because... As much as he claims data over dogma, he is all dogma, no data. 